Okay. Um, can you see the screen now? Yep. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you everybody for uh, for joining us today. I, again, uh, we apologize for the mistake uh, in the start time of today's webinar, um, but uh, we appreciate your um, accommodating us on that. And um, uh, without any further ado, we'll just get started. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with this uh, format, the free AWP conference webinar series is an opportunity for members of industry to get a preview of content that they can expect uh, to see at the annual AWP conference. Um, as you know, the conference is happening this October, that's October 2nd and 3rd uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, we're at the JW Marriott Houston Gallery location once again. And uh, every year we feature on the main stage uh, CII and COA based content. And uh, this year, um, uh, we, also, we also actually have uh, CII and COA based content in the breakout program as well. And uh, one of the uh, special breakout presentations focused on COA uh, best practices um, this year it is the AWP resource readiness presentation, uh, which is being presented by Glenn and Yogesh, uh, the co-chairs of the Advanced Work Packaging Committee for COA. And uh, Yogesh and Glenn have joined us today and uh, and put this presentation together for you um, to give you a, to give you a sense of uh, what you can expect and to give you a chance to ask them any questions that you might have before uh, meeting them face to face at the conference this year. So we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, today's uh, webinar speakers, as I mentioned, are Yogesh and Glenn, and I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, pass it over to, uh, to Yogesh right now to kick us off and uh, let these gentlemen introduce themselves. Actually, it's Glenn here. I'll be, go to the next slide. I'll, I'll be kicking it off. Oh, sure. Okay, quickly, uh, we just a couple of things. Uh, I always have an agenda. Uh, thanks, Steve, for already doing the introduction. Uh, we're going to go through first what our thoughts about resource readiness means. Uh, we're going to talk about path of construction, which we see is the, the main point that, around which readiness is built on. We're going to talk about EWP readiness assessment and how it is so related to CWC. So there's some people who are still trying to relate that to IWC. Also, we're going to talk about um, material readiness assessment, which is part of the material and the procurement work process by CWP. And, uh, we, re we used to call that PWP was the pro procurement work package, but uh, CII and COA are starting to move away from that and call it the procurement work process because there's a lot of cases it's not a package, it's a process. And then we're going to talk about some of the updated work-based planning rules on site readiness. And if we have time, we're going to talk also about uh, a new initiative that uh, COA is going to be working on is the AWP playbook. Uh, guidelines to industry of who, when, and how, uh, which are questions that we didn't answer in uh, IR 272. There we only talked about what and why of, of uh, AWP. So going to the next slide. This is sort of what we see is uh, when you talk of resource readiness, it's all centered around the path of construction to for a, a true AWP implementation, you need a very strong path of construction supported by engineering readiness, material readiness, on-site readiness, and finally, you have to have the people who are going to be using this have them in the right mindset. Okay, next slide. So, really it starts with the upfront alignment, which is in the uh, front end of the, of the uh, uh, project, and we consider that a prerequisite to all our resource readiness. Next slide. So, what path of construction is something that uh, unfortunately co op, uh, if you take a look at our website, it's fairly dated, and, and we have spent the last two or three years updating it. And, and uh, this year, we'll go live with our new. Uh, path of construction procedure and it'll have updates to that. Um, we're going to be definitely updating the workflow to, uh, to go more along with AWP because when we first set that up it was only really uh, we were looking at work-based planning back then and not AWP. We're going to talk about the inputs and outputs of the path of construction process. 
and we've got some new checklists that go along with it. So it's a, it's, it's a brand new procedure and we'll be talking about it at the conference, but uh, it won't be coming out till either late this year or beginning of 2019. Next slide. So when we talk of path construction, uh, you can see here, this could be a visualization of how construction sees uh, the sequence of doing a bunch of lower level modules. So they go through and do the first iteration of it and then engineering looks at it, procurement looks at it and they decide, okay, can they uh, uh, support that? Or there's some busts that they have to say, okay, no, that's not gonna work. We're gonna have to change the sequencing because of maybe a delivery of a, of a long lead item. So it's an iterative process, but first of all, construction starts by looking at how they would build it. They look at the boundaries of each of the CWPs. So each of those squares as we are rectangles could be a physical boundary of a defined CWP, which would then define the boundaries of each of the associated CWPs. So we're, we're gonna go into a little more detail of that at the conference, but it's that the guts of AWP is to get a good sequence and uh, durations of each of the CWPs and then supported by engineering and procurement. Next slide. So as you go through, you will find that uh, once you break down your whole project and you add it all up, uh, you're gonna have a whole bunch of EWPs and each of those EWPs are done by discipline. Uh, engineering works by discipline construction builds by by discipline so there should be a good match so you add them all up and normally we look at there should at least be a one-to-one -one relationship between an EWP and CWP but there are some cases where you may have more EWPs and CWPs so go to the next slide so this is sort of a representation. As you go down the left-hand side, this is how you start looking at it at a project project management view. You start looking at the project controls and your work breakdown structure. You go from unit to a construction work area to sub areas. And then what we're really looking at is along the bottom lines there is what AWP is all about is breaking down that work breakdown into EWPs, CWPs, IWPs, supported by the procurement work package. So as you see, it goes along, right along the bottom, you can see it start, uh, functionally it goes through engineering, construction planning, the execution, starting of the progressive turnover. Uh, somewhere along the line, you have to go from bulk construction to turnover by system, and eventually you turn it over by system. I think that's a fairly standard way of looking at what AWP is. Next slide. And what is key is that a lot of projects look at things that are done by work breakdown structures. You have a project in a different unit, but a lot of that is based on the concept of multiple disciplines. Whereas when you're working at AWP, again, we, we really wanna make sure it's job-based and it's single discipline. So everything you think of AWP it normally is by single discipline. Next slide. This is one of the key aspects of AWP is the green is called, the start of the green is the start of the, of, of, of an ind individual construction work package. That's the execution of the work. And what a lot of projects forget about is the orange, which is the middle, is the uh, float of the EWP, the, the actual formal issue of the EWP, and then time for the contractor to put his plan together to execute those EWPs. And engineering has to make sure that when, when they're supporting that CWP, they have allowed enough time 
uh, to actually execute their EWP. One of the key things that we found too in, in uh, AWP is that once the ownership transfers over from the EWP to the CWP, that contractor, one of the key steps should be to make sure he looks at the bill of material that has been supplied by the EWP and check it out and make sure that uh, there are field supply issues that the con or the engineer may or may not include in their EW or their bill of material. So that's again part of why you need time in that orange part in the middle there is time to build your package and get the uh, plans ready to start on the scheduled start of the CWP. Next. So this is what a, it's sort of a busy slide, but what we're trying to show is that uh, the upper part is the engineering work packages. And for some reason, you may have more than one EWP, uh, sub EWPs, that, uh, but you may only have one task in the schedule, which may be made up, you see there, it's uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. There might be six sub EWPs to make one EWP. And that could be a, as an example, could be a structure, uh, which is how you're going to build it. Uh, but there could be large bore, small bore, stainless steel, different levels. That, that's how the engineers are going to look at it. And that's how they're going to build it. But really what you're looking at is having all the EWP for that CWP ready at that blue triangle. And then leave yourself time to do the planning for this EWP prior to starting the execution. So again, it's sort of a busy slide, but it, it does show that in some cases there can be more than one EWP for a PW, or CWP. Next. Uh, this is something we've been uh, talking about at the AWP conference for probably the last two or three years is that we started off with engineering work package, trying to progress it by rules of credit, but we've, we've sort of changed our stand a little bit as, as we've been getting feedback from industry. So uh, instead of rules of credit, we now start talking about an EWP readiness assessment. So next slide. Again, this EWP is part of the stage two, which is part of the detailed engineering phase of the project. So uh, the schedule should be developed to a level three prior to going into detailed engineering. And really all engineering is doing at that stage is executing EWPs and issuing them to meet the construction schedule. Next. Now what you find in an engineering house in a lot of cases, they, they have, they've been doing this for years and they've got great processes and procedures of how they progress their individual deliver, deliverables. And so this could be some of the documents and you can see they have, you know, a start of engineering deliverable, they could be, you can get it up to 10% done. As you uh, get them a little further up along and sent to a to the company for approval or review, you can get up to cumulative of 60 cents. You can see it's, it's a fairly standard thing to do your documents. Next slide. But you can also have other things that are being progressed. There's, there's a 3D model, there's the checking of the model, uh, there's the uh, model reviews, internal reviews, client reviews, IFC, but it's that's for a drawing, but okay, what does a drawing, how does that relate to the overall progress of an individual EWP? And next slide is where we see where it all fits together. What we're uh, proposing and what we've been using for a guideline is that instead of using by drawings or by documents, these are all steps that almost everybody goes through in the engineering process, and either you you have it or you don't. You know, so as an example, uh, the third line, the preliminary vendor data, you've got it. You can accumulate up to 45, but 
one of the things that really we found that really holds back an EWP is the vendor data, the final vendor data, just seems to get lost and never gets there. So we, we don't allow an EWP to progress above 55% until that final vendor data is received. And as you can see, go down there, plus we also have another step at the bottom, which we see is very key, is that the engineer cannot claim as that EWP in 100% until construction accepts it. Because I don't know if everybody else has gone through the pain that I have. A lot of cases, the engineers claim they're 100% done, throw it over the fence, and uh, it's hard to get them back to work on it after they've claimed it as 100% because they're now starting to work on the next ones that they are supposed to be working on. So anyway, we it's just another thing we're we're doing. And we've, we've, this is the generic. We've, we've now started to uh, get EWP progress on all of the different disciplines, you know, civil, piling, electrical, uh, you know, all the different uh, disciplines. So some of those we'll probably be going to at the conference. Next slide. So what, what is all this EWP readiness? What's it really doing? What, what we're really trying to focus on is right where that little red arrow was pointing to is that uh, that is where the vendor data comes back from the supplier. And we want to make sure that those dates get into the database attributes so you can check to see if it's on time. Because if you don't get it on time, that lag you know, there's our 12-week lag that we recommend between the engineering package being issued and the construction work package starting. A lot of cases, because of vendor data, that EWP doesn't get get uh, released, and that uh, space between the EWP being issued and construction work just keeps getting squeezed and squeezed. And I've seen in many projects where it actually it's the EWP gets issued well after the original scheduled start of the construction work package. So, and some of the things that we see that uh, uh, hold that back is final vendor data not received. We've got the line route routing or routing is not complete. PNIDs are not IFC. Line designation tables not IFC. So there's a whole bunch of engineering things that could affect that EWP package being issued. Next slide. So what we're really trying to do is an EWP readiness assessment, and that's that's an assessment. We it's a it's a re report that we expect that a project can run at any time by individual CWP, so that we can really start looking uh, early to see if there's any delays. We want to reduce the delays. We really want to improve that vendor data interface. We want to really ensure the completeness of the content of each EWP, and we want to improve collaboration with construction. Next slide. I'll let Yogesh take over here, uh, and I'll come back in a little later. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so once we have ensured that we have engineering readiness being taken care of by the very well understood AWP process, dividing the work scope with engineering work packages and pre-planning with construction work packages and IWP for on-site execution. One key component that did not get addressed significantly is if you don't have the material, we can't go anywhere even if you have all the drawings. So having put a lot of effort on the engineering deliverable side, our committee has formed a subcommittee for what we call the PWP subcommittee to put more light into what can be improved for material readiness. Next slide. So last year we discussed what the procurement work process is all about. Uh, as Glenn mentioned earlier, we have moved away from the definition of PWP originally stated as a procurement work package. Uh, but uh, when people are really looking for a package, that isn't what you're creating here. It's a report and a process. So May of 2018, we formally announced PWP to be utilized as a procurement work process term. 
and uh, not to expect a package being created additional to the three other packages that everybody's familiar with. So we are moving forward from that in terms of the procurement work process. Uh, on the next slide, uh, if you could take us, Steve, you want to rethink what are you buying? Most of the time, the emphasis is on the item and the commodity that we are purchasing. We need, a, we need it later at some point of time as per the RAS date or required at site date. And everything in our systems, machine, and the processes is geared towards getting the material delivered on site. However, we would like to suggest that as supply chain people who are supporting advanced work packaging, they're buying two things. They're buying the commodity, but they're also buying vendor data. And a discipline is required for, for the packages that are depending on vendor data to put a required requirement of vendor data, the RAV date. The required uh, RAV date is mainly the requirement of vendor data. And that date is uh, to be utilized as one of the key aspects of developing the engineering work package. So we are suggesting to rethink buying, you're buying the, the data first, the vendor data first, and the commodity that has to show up, of course, that you need at site. Next, Steve. Again, on, uh, from a process side, there is a lot of emphasis on getting the low cost, good quality, good service, good performance of the particular item or commodity, and you rank the vendor based on that, we are also suggesting to include an analyze, analyzing the vendor's performance on participation, collaboration, and being part of the process to provide you the vendor data and be, be part of uh, the, the AWP method of execution requires a level of maturity to maintain information by work packages and be able to produce information and provide status by work packages. So process conformance is another part that we are suggesting to start evaluating vendors as well as the products that they provide you. Third aspect of it is uh, the demand-driven material requirements planning. And this is where, as you're executing things in construction, changes happen, uh, schedule, it could be related to schedule or site conditions, et cetera. The typical material requirements method, uh, the, the forecast-based material requirements planning is typically where engineering is looking to, gen where engineering generates the quantity supply chain uh, does the material acquisition, vendor supplies it, and it arrives at site. The linear forward downstream type of method is the typical forecast-based method. What we are saying is that organizations need to have the capability to bring in demand-driven material requirements planning where the varying conditions at site now can be communicated uh, and be throughout the supply chain network, it can go all the way back to the vendor who's participating in the program to be able to either change the delivery, hold the material at their end, or provide other creative ways to reduce cost and just not deliver and be more, uh, say, participative in the overall process. And of course, that necessitates greater collaboration and improve connectivity from a digital point of view. And it's just not a vendor supplier type of relationship. It is a more participatory and re requires some cognitive abilities of uh, finding out patterns and learning from various equipment or commodities that are being supplied and provide inputs back to the contractor that this is how things can be managed better. So demand-driven materials requirement planning is one more aspect that we are introducing. And lastly, if you can take us to the next slide, Steve. We're looking at improving the materials visibility. And this is where the PWP report that catalogs uh, starts revealing right from the stage of when engineering is raised in MR, 
and all the way to procurement, putting a purchase order, and uh, the transportation logistics and uh, site warehousing, receiving, etc. All that comes into a pic in a clear picture by an EWP is what we are looking at recommending. And in this realm, CII already took uh, a specific topic which they had presented in their earlier seminar. And Bill O'Brien, who will be participating in this uh, conference, will be bringing up in the plenary. But uh, visibility of materials, that also is an important aspect as far as the material readiness go. So four key things, if you may have, if you can move it to the next slide, Steve. Okay. Uh, before I go on to on-site readiness, uh, we, we looked at a couple of process improvements, visibility improvement, and of course the demand-driven material requirements planning on the vendor from a supply chain perspective and material readiness. Let's talk about uh, the field readiness, the on-site readiness. And in this case, I'm not going to go over the off-beaten uh, topic related to constraint management, getting all the resources, scaffolding, permits, safety, et cetera, taken care of. Let's talk about a few more things that we are introducing in our current session from 2018 to 19. Uh, next slide, Steve. What we are going to share is the updated work phase planning rules. Now work phase F, some of you who are new to AWP, this was the original term which was to, to that captures all the activities that we do at the work front prior and AWP basically is everything that you do preceding work phase planning. So work phase planning rules were created in around 2003 to 2005 and that was developed prior to AWP. Those old rules emphasized hours and number of planners. It's still available at our COA website, I believe. But uh, what we want to share in this session will be the updated draft, which will be published again. And it includes the AWP approach. We have dismantled the notion of that a work, an IWP should be 1,000 hours. That was 10-man crew, 10-day shift, operating 10 days. Uh, so that is being dismantled and so is that one is to 50 planners. You have to have so many planners. Those things are no longer part of this new rules. So there are, we've identified additional things that uh, are part of planning for the work phase and be re being ready for it. And those details will be shared in the conference with you. Next slide. Now we got the engineering, we did a great job in getting everybody together, got the upfront alignment in path of construction where engineering, project control, supply chain and construction people have agreed on. And we've come up with uh, the breakdown philosophy, we've put the schedule, we've come up with the float, et cetera, as Glenn mentioned. We, got taken care, we have taken care of engineering readiness, material readiness, and on-site readiness, but if the people are not willing to change, or if they are not interested in improving productivity on the project they're on, all this can fall flat on our face. So the important part is getting the mindset ready to do an AWP style execution. And here in May, I had the opportunity as TechnoBuild to present on the COA session what we can do as far as getting people mindset, the softer aspects of it, along with uh, one of my colleagues, Narges, who comes from a psychology background. Next slide. In this, what we are talking about is um, how can we mimic or take the success of health, safety, and environment practices, which were pioneered in the late uh, 80s by DuPont, where we talked about the DuPont Bradley curve and slowly improved the safety statistics that uh, industry has now in North America. And they worked through it. How can we take a similar approach and bring productivity into the equation? And as every worker, every employee gets onboarded on the project, as you are having this either a one hour orientation session or a half a day or a two day 
depending on where the site is and what they're doing with it. It's important to introduce mindfulness and productivity as a topic in the very beginning of executing the job and start getting people oriented to how they will be performing in this project and introducing the topic, whether it's a helping hand or a senior project director or construction director, bringing the mindfulness and productivity conversation on the first 10 days of the job may set the pace of how that job will perform. So we are talking, we presented some of the improvements in where, where is the current organizational mindfulness as far as productivity is concerned, how to benchmark that, how can we implement mindfulness and project teams and at work site especially, and how leadership and change can be brought about using some softer aspects of being effective at site. And just to quote an example, when we were in Japan talking about productivity to Japanese, uh, uh, say, industry, I was told by one of the colleagues there that, Yogesh, when you talk about productivity, it doesn't make sense to us because culturally, we in Japan feel ashamed to be non-productive or to waste things. And the term they used was motai nai. So productivity is a culture change too, besides all the technology, the work packaging, and everything else you bring to the table. That's what is being discussed in this aspect of readiness for AWP. Glenn, do you want to help? Yeah, uh, yeah. okay, so that, that brings us back to our, our original slide. And this is something we want to keep leading people for is, is that we, we, we talked about uh, engineering readiness. Uh, we talked about uh, the material readiness, the uh, procurement work process, and the uh, material readiness assessment. Talked about on-site readiness, which is there's some changes that we're implementing uh, from what our guidelines were years ago, and the newest one that they're really trying to and I really it's, I'm I'm quite pleased at how well this is getting received by industry is that uh, there's quite a bit of interest in the soft side of selling the implementation of AWP. You know that there's uh, we're not geared to just being told what to do anymore. You know, it, it, uh, Psychologically, it's, it's, it's quite quite a chore to get people to buy in sometimes, but, but it's all geared around the path of construction, having having a good solid path of construction process. It's an iterative process, but have that in in place by the time you get into at least you've got to have that set by the time you get into detailed engineering. So I'm uh, glad we have some more time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. What we want to talk about next is, is uh, and this is an initiative that we're going to uh, start working on as COLA. We're going to have a, a new uh, committee uh, looking at this. Uh, what we're hearing from industry is, okay, great. You've uh, done the IR 272, which is the guideline for implementing AWP. But really all you told us is uh, what AWP is, and you told us why AWP is required. Uh, but you haven't told us or given us any guidelines of, okay, now how do we get our procedures and processes in place? How do we make sure that they're done on time? Uh, who is responsible for it? But so there's that who, when, and how we need to to talk about. And and we see there are going to be two very separate and distinct playbooks. One for the front end, right from the front end planning as the project starts right to till the end of detailed engineering, and then a separate playbook for the uh, construction execution, which is the workspace planning portion of the project. Uh, go to the next slide. What I, what I thought we'd just give you is uh, maybe some examples of uh, uh, what are the types of things we're going to be addressing in a playbook. So 
Uh, first one is how to implement processes to support the deliverables. And one of the examples we said is, okay, uh, for the uh, engineering uh, progress or readiness assessment and for the material readiness assessment, in your project database, there's quite a few attributes that you're going to have to set up. And what are some of those attributes? And, and some of them are going to be dates. I'll just give you an example of that. It could be for each piece of engineered equipment that you need vendor data, you're going to want the date that the discipline engineer is going to have to schedule to have his equipment um, requisition or uh, some people call it your material requisition to go to supply chain. And it's going to have to be very clearly say what date they need that vendor data by. That's just an example and that uh, I can actually see it being three dates. For each one of those dates there's going to be the scheduled date and then supply chain will have to uh, provide dates for the forecast date and then an actual date. So as you're doing a report, anytime you see a slippage uh, that could create a, a, a delay on your EWP, you're, you're going to get some very, it's going to be very visible and it's going to be very early information. So it's, it, we see that as leading indicators that are going to help us with AWP. Next, you have to, okay, now who's responsible? Oops, sorry, back. Uh, you know, for all these different attributes that you need, need, who's going to actually provide that list? Who's going to, who's going to decide which, which uh, attributes are going to be used? And then once you've got those attributes, uh, those different fields within your AWS or your uh, database, who is going to be responsible for the input? And you want to be very clear what the content, the content and format of each of those inputs is. And finally, when are those deliverables required? So again, for all those uh, attributes, when are the attributes required and what is the timing cycle for the input of the database? So that's just one little small section of, call it uh, AWP, but you can see how, how complicated it can start to get of how, who, and when. And so as you go through the whole AWP process, there's going to be quite a few uh, maybe gaps that people don't understand, and we're going to try to fill some of those gaps. So I think that's uh, where our presentation for today is going to end off, and we uh, we could open it up maybe for questions, Steve. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for, for that. I'm actually going to um, uh, kick this presentation out of uh, full screen mode so that I can have a look at the, uh, the Q&A. So I'm actually gonna stop the screen share, if that's all right, and uh, I will move over to the audience view so we can see if anybody has any questions for the panelists. Um, there's a few different ways to submit your questions, either directly through uh, the chat window, or you can use the Q&A feature, um, or you can raise your hand uh, using the raise hand button in your panel, and uh, we can allow you to speak directly to to uh, Glenn or Yogesh. So um, there's only a handful of uh, attendees currently online, but uh, is there anyone uh, that would like to uh, to ask a question or make a comment? This one, maybe people are getting their heads together but maybe about a question is that uh, when we talk about working forward with our uh, AWP playbook, I, I must uh, say that CII is very interested in that concept, and we're not sure yet, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised we have a joint COAA CII uh, committee uh, to help put that together so we get the input from across North America and maybe even globally of, 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 uh, of the playbook. And if there's people interested, uh, at, the, at the conference, we'll definitely be looking for volunteers for this new committee.
And and so how can um, how can individuals uh, volunteer or express interest for the committee? Should they reach out to COA through the website, or can they reach you uh, you or you directly? Um, they can contact either Yogesh or I uh, uh, directly, and and uh, I think or or they pro probably the contact right now is you, but you could forward it to us because I don't know if you've given. Uh, the attendees are actual uh, email addresses, but uh, sure, I, I'm sure if they contact you, that you could forward it to us, or or you could provide them our our contacts, and we'd be more than happy to talk to them. Absolutely, okay. I think well, uh, if it's okay with you, I can uh, include your email address in a uh, a follow up message fo after the uh, webinar today, and then uh, if anyone does want to get involved, they they can they can reach you directly. Another question we get quite often from from industry. I, I don't know. Maybe you want to handle this one, Yogesh. Is that why are we changing from procurement work package to procurement work process and material readiness assessment? Yeah, mainly because of uh, the tangibility that everybody's uh, starting to assemble a package, and most project managers who haven't got familiar with the overall concept then end up uh, putting people on the spot that I didn't get a procurement work package from you. And in certain cases, it is also the, the redundancy of information that also becomes, okay, what am I doing new in the procurement work package? And essentially it's a report. So that's the reason then we went on to clarify this. Long back, if you remember, the advanced work packaging was supposed to be enhanced work packaging, the EWP. And guess what? It would have caused a lot of havoc in North America, especially until we changed it to AWP. So I think terminology is the main thing, but also setting expectations of what to expect as far as the procurement process is concerned. It's the data and the reporting that's more important. One of the things we keep finding from industry is that AWP is very data centric. And one of the key things on, on the project moving forward will be the database or databases and how they are utilized to get your readiness assessment. So uh, I can't put enough emphasis on, on data. It's, it's going to be the uh, the big change in AWP is that we've got we've got all this data now. How do we use it, and how do we make sure it's right? Okay, great. Well, if uh, if there are no further questions, uh, are there any additional comments, uh, Glenn or you guess you'd like to add or? Um, no, I just I just say this is a very high level and fast. You know, uh, we, we geared up this uh, webinar for just uh, to give people an idea of, of of what they're going to hear or see at the AWP conference. Uh, I, I I know we weren't able to get into much detail because we were trying to get it all out in about 30, 40 minutes. So uh, we have twice as much time at the conference and. Plus, I think we'll have a few handouts and there's a little bit more information we'll have. So uh, look forward to seeing anybody who's going to, who's online, who's going to be at the conference. On my, on my part, uh, Steve, I'd like to state that advanced work packaging is getting some traction in the industry. However, it needs to be carefully analyzed before you start working with it because it is, to implement AWP is not cheap. It is co it, it does cost to do the project the AWP way. And to get the maximum benefit of the investment that you do in some additional upfront work, if it doesn't translate to all the productivity that can only be seen the, at the maximum in the supply chain world as well as on-site execution, then only there is advantages of doing the AWP. So it, it, it careful consideration needs to go into doing AWP as you come on board and do this on your projects. Okay, well, um, I think uh, now is a good time to wrap up then. I really appreciate 
everyone uh, for taking the time today to uh, join us live. We will send out a, a link to view the recording to all registrants as well. And uh, as I mentioned, I'll uh, provide uh, contact information so that you can reach out to Glenn or Yogesh directly to express uh, any interest that you may have in uh, getting involved in COA AWP initiatives. Uh, also, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, registration is still open for the Advanced Work Packaging Conference, and we'd love to see everyone there. Um, awpconference.com has all the information you need and is always being updated as new information becomes available. Um, if there's anybody, uh, if you're already planning to come to the conference and you want to help spread the word, we'd sure appreciate it. Uh, there are some handouts, uh, a conference lookbook, and uh, a downloadable PDF calendar, a variety of things uh, on the website that you can download and, and email uh, within your networks and uh, and let people know that the conference is coming and, and that you think they should be there too. So uh, looking forward to seeing Glenn and Yogesh uh, both at the conference. And again, um, they're going to be presenting this presentation in our breakout program and uh, the full schedule again is online. So uh, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, uh, Glenn and Yogesh, for your hard work on this presentation. And uh, we will talk to you again very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye. Bye.